this morning, and I'll give you the message that the Lord showed me in this passage of Scripture. Matthew chapter 26, we're going to read verses 31 through 35. The Bible says, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I'll smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I'll go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus saith unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Let's ask God to bless the preaching. Father, I love you this morning. I thank you so much for uh, the fact that you don't change and I can stand on you. And I pray now this morning that we would just plant our feet on Jesus Christ, on the words of God, that this entire church, every person here, would tune their mind and their heart to hear from you and to give you our ear and to understand, Lord, in this passage of Scripture, the things that we need to unpack here and unfold. Uh, Lord, there's a, there's a teaching here that you showed me, God, that's in this text that I need, that every person in this room needs. So I pray you'd help me, God. I ask you to fill me with your spirit. I ask you to be with my mind, be with my mouth, be with my heart. Help me to follow you. And I pray, Lord, that you'd reveal your words to your people. Give them the help they need this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you can be seated. What I want to preach to you on is being offended because of Jesus. It's kind of a strange thing to think, a strange phrase, and I, to be honest with you, I would have never come up with it if I hadn't been reading this text and trying to pay attention and asking God to show me something. What jumped out at me is in verse number 31, Jesus said unto them, saith unto them, All ye shall be offended, watch it, because of me this night. I I never really thought of being offended that way. I'm offended. Why are you offended? Because of Jesus. So that made me then start thinking and considering what it really means to be offended. Because you and I kind of like define offended a specific way in our modern language and our modern mindset. But to be offended actually according to the Bible, according to this text, as you study the word offended, it, it has to do, an offense has to do with an attack. It's to assail, it's to displease, it's to make angry, to annoy, to shock, to wound, to pain. Now watch this, to be scandalized, to be stumbled. Jesus Christ gives his disciples a prophecy in verse number 31. He says, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. He tells them right out, he says, listen to me, every one of you is going to be offended because of me. You're going to be stumbled up. You're going to be scandalized. You're going to be pained. You're going to be annoyed. You're going to be aggravated. You're going to be hurt because of me, because of your affiliation with who I am and what I'm about to do, you're going to get offended. The weird thing to me is the disciples tell him, no, Lord, that's not going to happen. Not me. Never me. I mean, there's a lot of things, Lord, that will offend me. There's a lot of things that are going to ruffle my feathers. I'm going to get upset about, I mean, people, Lord, really offend me. And let me just tell you something. People will offend you. I don't care how much you love me. Eventually, if you stay around long enough, I will offend you. I I don't say that because I'm going to try. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not like I'm looking for my chance to see and test your mettle. And I'm just telling you that sooner or later, you're not going to like something I do. I'm going to annoy you. I have that ability. It's innate within me. My father told me years ago, and I've never forgotten it. He told me repeatedly throughout my life, you have a face that I just want to (laughs) slap. 
No, that was not when I was being bad. It wasn't back talk. It wasn't rebellion. It was just like I walk up, hey, Dad, like, what's up, boy? You know? Well, understanding that about myself, I embraced it, and I learned very much how to be annoying. At one point, my older sister grabbed a pencil, charged at me, pushed me back with her forearm as a shield, and was trying to stab me with the pencil as I defended myself, very, very indignantly and shocked because I was taught never to hit a woman. She kind of deserved it. She wasn't a woman. She was a girl. I wasn't a man, yet I was a boy. I could justify that now, but my brain wasn't working like that back then. You understand what I'm saying? She did have it coming. I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, she tried to stab me with the pencil. He said, you deserved it. No defense for me. Why? Well, I, I learned how to be annoying. Some people try, but some people do it on accident. When we were teenagers, the same sister picked up a metal chair in the basement and threw it at me. What happened? I offended her. What did you do? I annoyed her. You see, you're eventually going to get offended. People will annoy you. And we immediately, when we see the word offense, that's kind of what we think of, right? Well, pastor, it didn't shake my hand. Well, wah, wah, wah. Yeah, you know, this morning, I'm not here to preach about all that kind of stuff. Because, really, it's annoying. What's annoying? It's annoying when people get offended about foolishness. You know what that means? That means it offends me that you're offended about something dumb. We're both human, right? We're not talking about that kind of offense this morning. The offense that I want to preach to you about this morning is much deeper than that. And if you can grab a hold of this offense, if you can learn about this offense, it's going to take you to a level between you and the Lord where all the other stuff just is like nothing. It's insignificant. You understand. And, and th listen, one thing I love about this church is so far, the people God has put together here, you're pretty mature about the dumb stuff. I really appreciate that as a pastor. I know pastors that are getting gray hairs not just because they're getting gray early. I, I mean, getting gray hairs because of the pressure that's on them, because of the foolishness of the people and everything that's offend, they're offended about, everything that's annoying them, everything that's aggravating them, everything that's hurting them. And it's just like, it's a constant barrage of stupidity all the time. I'm thankful that I, I know some of you get offended. I do know that. I appreciate the fact that you know how to just deal with it and move on and say, you know what, that's not really the issue. We're not here for that. We're here because of Jesus Christ. Now, there's an offense here that's going to come your way that's because of Jesus Christ that's on a whole other level. This offense in the passage is a truth that is a negative truth. The disciples rejected the truth here because the truth was negative, and it was negative about them. I've said it before. You're going to hear it. You're going to, you're going to be able to finish the sentence before I'm done. But if you love truth, that love for truth will be tested not by doctrine and rightly dividing and learning your Bible. The love for truth will be tested when the truth comes to you that is about you and it's a negative truth about you. When you can accept the negative truths about yourself and say God is right and I am wrong and that was the truth and I love the truth enough to where I'll admit that I'm wrong and I will accept that truth so that I can be right with God because I love the truth. Then you really love truth. So it's way deeper than just King James Bible, rightly dividing doctrine, this, that, and the other thing. It's way deeper than that. Do you really love the truth? The Lord Jesus Christ gave the disciples the truth, and the truth was a negative truth about them, and they didn't want to hear that truth. But you'll notice it was such a deep truth that he not only prophesied what they were going to do, but he gave them scripture to back his prophecy. Look at verse 31. For it is written, See that? He says, fellas, I'm going to tell you, you're all going to be offended because of me this night, and here's the Bible on it. I'm going to prove to you, not just that I'm prophesying, but I'm prophesying based on Old Testament Scripture. Jesus Christ could have prophesied without Old Testament Scripture. You do understand that, right? 
He could tell when somebody was sick from a distance. He could tell what was going to happen next, decisions people were going to make. This prophecy was, was, I mean, it had a verily, verily to it. There was no escaping it. No matter how much the disciples disagreed with it or swore up and down they'd never do it or how much grit and guts and character and determination they had, he said, you guys are going to be offended because of me and it's going to happen this night. And the scripture says, I'll smite the shepherd and the sheep, sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. You know where this offense is coming from? It's because of Jesus. Because of their affiliation with Jesus Christ, right? You know where this offense is coming from? This offense is coming from the enemy. Now, as a Christian, you realize you have three enemies, right? The world, the flesh, and the devil. You know what your number one enemy is? It's not the devil. You know what your number one enemy is? It's not the world. We like to preach against the world because the world aggravates us, right? It offends us. It annoys us. It pains us. It's hard sometimes to watch the insanity level of the world around us. But the real enemy, the big enemy that I have, yes, it is the world. Yes, it is the devil. But the main enemy I have is the flesh. And the world and the devil are set up on either side of the flesh and they're set up in such a way and they operate in such a way as to really be able to aggravate, provoke, trouble, stumble up, offend, scandalize and pain the flesh. The Christian's number one job is to get their ear to the heartbeat of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian's number one job in life is to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God. It's to recognize when He's speaking and when you're speaking. It's to lean away from self, away from flesh, and into the Spirit of God through the Word of God, close to Jesus Christ, so that the world and the devil can't get advantage of you. You yield your members, your body, Book of Romans, as instruments to righteousness. What he's telling us is he's saying, listen, fellas, you're going to fail. And I'm telling you, you're going to fail this night. And I'm telling you, the reason you're going to fail is not because you're a failure. Did you hear me? The reason you're going to fail is not because you don't want to do right. The reason you're going to fail is not because you're trying. The reason, because you're not trying. The reason you're going to fail is not because you're wrong. The reason you're going to fail is because you're trying to do right. That's what's happening. He said, he didn't say you're going to be offended because you allowed the flesh to take over. You're going to be offended because somebody else did something. He said, you're going to be offended because of me. You fellows have aligned yourself with me. And guess what, guys? What you don't realize is there's more going on in the world, in the universe right now, in the mind of God right now, than you can possibly grab a hold of. And because you've aligned with me, you're going to be offended because there's a pressure coming on me and that pressure is going to get passed on to you and you can't handle the pressure coming your way. You're going to be offended because they're going to smite the shepherd and without me, you guys need to learn something. Without me, you can do nothing. Amen. Peter says, oh Lord, not me. The disciples join him, oh Lord, not us. But look at verse 32. All this is going over their heads. He says, but after I am risen again, I'll go before you into Galilee. You know what he said to them? You're going to be offended tonight because of me. The enemy's going to come and he's going to smite me and the the sheep are going to be scattered abroad. But don't worry, I already know how you're going to fail. I already know what you're going to do wrong. I already know how bad you're going to mess up, and I want you to know something. I'm ahead of you. I go before you into Galilee. You see that? Now, ain't that something else? He is telling them, you guys are going to be offended. You guys are going to mess up. And interestingly enough, this whole thing, it takes place in, in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? Gethsemane means an olive press. Look at verse 36. Then Jesus cometh with them into a place called Gethsemane, right? And say it to the disciples, sit ye here yonder while I go and pray yonder. Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. You know what Gethsemane means? I just told you. So Gethsemane is a garden on the Mount of Olives. 
and it means an olive press. Did you know the tree of life? You've read about that in the book of Revelation. It was back in the Garden of Eden. You know what the tree of life is? It's an olive tree. What happens when you press an olive is oil comes out. We've talked about the anointing oil. We've talked about recently in some of our services and the oil of the Spirit of God. And He's going to be pressed in that garden and the, the tree of life is being pressed. The Lord Jesus Christ is being pressed in that garden. The pressure that's on Him and the oil is going to come out, the blood of the olive. You know, I don't care what, was it Steve Jobs? Is he the Apple guy? I don't care what, he believed like everybody has believed for whatever reason, and I have no idea in the Bible. I cannot find it in the Bible. If you find it in the Bible for me, show me, please, where this thing about Eve eating an apple came from. You think the apple on that with a bite out of it, you think that's a, a coincidence? He's inventing witty devices that have been used to connect people. When God back in the Tower of Babel said, I need to spread them out. I need to disconnect them. I need to make sure that they can't connect. He's reconnecting people the first time in human history since the Tower of Babel, reconnecting them in a way you can communicate with somebody that doesn't even speak your language. You're going to tell me that's not demonic? And then reprogramming brains to where people can't even sit down and read a book anymore. You think that's significant since you're supposed to be reading your Bible? reprogramming brains so that they can't sit. If a guy preaches for an hour, it's like, oh my goodness, you're killing me. My kids can't do this. Well, that's nothing years ago. That's something pretty demonic going on, ain't it? Now relax, I got a phone. You all text me on them. I text you on them and all the rest of that, okay? I'm not trying to turn this into Amish, but I'm just saying, you need to understand the way the world's wired and it's set up against your flesh and there's a demonic piece to it. Eve didn't bite an apple. You know what kind of a tree that, that serpent was in? He was in a vine tree. You know what he gave her? A grape. The fruit she was eating wasn't an apple. Hence the lifelong battle of Christianity against alcohol. Fermented wine is alcohol. Adam comes walking up on that scene and he takes one look at her. I imagine when she bit that grape, man, she had the best buzz of her life. At first, she said, man, that feels good. Whew, something just changed. Something did change. The water that had been running through her circulatory system that was living water, Jesus Christ is a living water, turned to blood. That's why Adam walked up and she never explained nothing to him. He looked right at her and said, uh-oh, her complexion completely changed. He could tell something was different. Adam took that thing and ate it, knowing what he was doing. There's more to your Bible than what meets the eye. There's more to your Bible than just the superficial fake applications that you get all the time. I mean, do you ever stop and say, where in the world did I get that from? A TV show? It's just been told that? The back of my smartphone? Where did I get that from? You know, Jesus Christ is in this garden and he's being pressed in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's, a, it's an olive press. That's what Gethsemane means. You know what he's under? He's under pressure. He's under pressure that goes beyond what you and I can possibly imagine. Here the disciples are, and they're getting offended because of the Lord, but here's what I want you to see on that offense, because you're going to have the same offense. I want you to see that this offense is not the same way that you would say when you say, oh, that offended me. It's not what it is. This is offense is supernatural. This offense is demonic. Now, the Bible tells us we're not ignorant of his devices, right? The devil's devices. And it says what about him? That he was more what than any beast of the field. The serpent was more subtle. So when the devil begins to work on a disciple, he's going to do it so subtly, you're not even going to know it's him. And what he does so subtly that you don't even know it's him is he sets you up and he strangles the life out of you without you even knowing what's going. You did not see that coming. You did not know it would come from that direction. And when it came that direction and when you felt it hit you, you didn't know what it was that was hitting you. You would never associate that with an attack from the devil because if you did, he wouldn't be that subtle. 
He's got power and wisdom that surpasses the wisdom of Daniel. He's got power to where Michael the archangel needed backup. So you and I need the word of God. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. We need this text this morning so that we can not be ignorant of his devices, but we can see how it works so that we don't fall prey and quit when we get offended. Because I'm telling you this morning, doubtless, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Who do they come through? In this text, they come through Judas. They come through the spirit of Antichrist. The first offense that I notice is the offense of failing personally. Look at verse number 33. Peter answered and said unto him, All men, though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. You know what Peter believed? Peter believed in the depths of his soul, I will never be offended because of Jesus. Here's the crazy thing about that. Peter has already proven it. It's one thing for somebody who just got saved to come in and be all excited about serving the Lord, right? And they should be. I love that. I, I, I never like, oh, just, we'll see if it's real. Give it a few months, you know. Never. I mean, never. That, that's, a, that's a blessing. That's encouraging. You know what the Lord does with that for me? When somebody just gets saved and I see that excitement, and they, or they just get into the Bible-believing church, and I see that excitement, it re-excites me. Because it helps me remember, man, what we have is real. I, I mean, I, I kind of gotten used to it, and I should never get used to this. This is wonderful. This is amazing. I love what I've got. Thank God for it. It's great to see that when they first get going. But eventually, the offense has come. Eventually, the devil attacks. Here the disciples are in the garden. You know, they, 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 I'm never going to quit. I'm never going to quit on God. Okay, newbie. But you better be careful because you know what? When the devil sees how serious you are about the Lord, when the devil sees that God's got a hold of you and God's changed you and you are not planning on quitting, you are there for the long haul and you're excited about this, you are in like Peter. You are in lock, stock, and barrel. Folks, he walked away from everything. Peter likely had family problems because of his love for and commitment to Jesus Christ. He walked away from the family business. He threw away a career. He threw away a future in this world to follow around one where he said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said, I will go with him. I'll walk with him. I'll be with him. I will give up everything so that I can be with my Savior. I know he's the one. I'm going to follow him. Everybody's making fun of those guys. You understand that? The whole world thought they were crazy. All the religious leaders. He leaves a good career to connect himself to the riffraff, to the lowlife, to the common man. It was all the messed up people that flooded to Jesus, right? It was all the people that were maimed and sick and blind and demon-possessed and had nothing and the ones he was feeding and all the people that just, you know, the religious crutch. None of the successful, influential people, are very few, are following him around. Peter affiliates and aligns himself with all the riffraff, the off-scour. He wasn't the cool kid anymore. He had given up everything to be with Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, you're going to be offended in me, he said from the depths of his soul, never. Look, when a man knows he's willing to give his life, a real man, that's proven it, right? Like a soldier who says, you know what? My buddies are going and I'm going. You understand that there's a connection there? that runs deeper than what anybody can really understand or imagine unless you've ever experienced it. I love watching these military videos. You see the videos on the A-10 Warthog? Man, that's cool. I mean, I always thought about being a fighter pilot when I was a kid, but I never thought about that one, that A-10 Warthog. And I don't like watching the videos that are made by somebody who obviously just studies this stuff and some kid in his mom's basement that knows how to put together a video and make it look cool with the... 
and stuff. And, and, he, and he, he, he scrounges the internet and pulls from everybody else's and puts them together. You can tell if you're not careful, no matter how professional it is, you can tell if you're not careful what the real deal is and what's fake. When you watch a video like that, you got to find somebody that's been in combat that's actually flown the A-10 Warhog that can explain to you the tone and the tension in the voices of his comrades when he's flying overhead, taking out the enemy, and hearing the pinging of the bullets off of the Humvee that his buddies are hiding behind, and they're pinned down, and they're taking casualties, and they call in backup, and then you come in and give them backup, and you can see, you can hear, I'm talking 30, 40-year-old men, 50-year-old men talking back about Afghanistan or a desert storm. You can hear their voice crack, and you can watch them try not to cry when they're talking about coming in, putting their own life at risk to come in and bail their buddies out of a bind. It has a power to it. He doesn't have to yell. He doesn't have to get excited. He, doesn't, he just sits and talks about it, and you go, man, that guy's got it. You understand the connection that there is there when you sacrifice together and put your life on the line and sell out for something and are dedicated to it? That was Peter. He'd already proven it. And the Lord said, you're going to be offended. And he said, uh-uh. You know what offense the devil's going to use on you? When you fail and you never thought you would. Peter is so bold and so aggressive and such a leader, such a strong personality, that when he speaks up, everybody else jumps in behind him. Verse 35. Oh, I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. Yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. That's the personality he's got. Now you fellas, especially you fellas, it's different for ladies, so to try to speak to it, you do the same thing in your own ways, but for me to try to speak to it, I, I can't really do real well. But for you fellas, like if you're the guy, right, your homies are there, and you got a reputation, you built that reputation, you backed it up, you proved it. It's pretty humiliating when your reputation gets smashed, ain't it? You make yourself look like a failure, like an idiot. You know what's going to happen to you sooner or later in the Christian life? You're going to fail in a way you thought you never would. Now, I'm not talking about some big moral corruption or anything like that. But you're going to fail in a way you never thought you would. And you know what the devil's going to do with that? He's going to get, on, get in on you so close and so serious and get on your back and start choking you and strangling you. You won't be able to get it off. You embarrassed yourself in front of the whole world. You let the Lord down. You shocked yourself. And that's an offense the devil will use to get you out of church. Go to the book of Revelation, please. Look at chapter 12. I want you to see something about your adversary. Revelation chapter number 12. Look at verse 10. I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. You know what's happening here? There, there's, a, there's rejoicing, there's shouting, there's excitement in heaven. Why? Because they're seeing the accuser of the brethren, the devil. You have to understand this, this morning, that's all I wanted you to see on that, that he's called the accuser of the brethren. The devil's goal is to make sure that you fail sooner or later. And when you do, he wants God, country, and everybody to know all about your mess up, and he'll get that advantage on you, and he'll drive it in knowing that your conscience is guilty and your heart is smitten before God, and he won't let you out from under it. It'll always be your mess up. And he'll rub it in your face in front of everybody. And he'll keep it at the forefront of your mind at all times. And that is an offense that a lot of Christians never, ever make it through because they think they messed up so bad. They think it's the Spirit of God convicting them about what they did. They think the fellowship is broken even though they got it right. They hear people talking about what they used to do or they think people are still talking about it. And that offense can get so heavy. 
I, I don't mean to overstep here, but I've seen it in some of the older folks. Because it's like, well, if I'd have got saved younger, well, I knew better and I wasted my whole life. Well, if I'd have just got in when you did, well, if I'd have just raised my kids like you're raising yours, you know what happened to you? You're offended. You don't realize it because that's how subtle the devil is. You don't understand what he's doing to your mind and your heart, but that's the devil. The Lord went before you. He knew all about this before. He knew what you were going to do before you did it. Don't you think his blood is enough? Don't you think he understands his goal? Don't you think he knows his agenda? Don't you think he can work in spite of you? Your personal failures will be something the devil will use to get you out. He said, smite the sheep. Smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Those kind of failures and mess-ups and mistakes and the guilt, the guilt of that sin. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Anybody ever done something and you felt guilty? And you got right with God and you still feel guilty? That, that feeling that I just want, I just feel the pressure of this constantly. I just, oh. Like when you're a kid and you're just going to get to your mom and dad before you get caught because you... They're smiling, and they look at you, and, hey, good to see you. you. Have a good day. And you know what you did, and the sun's shining, and everybody's happy, but you can't be. That's the guilt of sin. That's the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That guilt weighing on you, that guilt's a good thing. Until, until you've given it to Jesus Christ. Then it can become a tool of the devil. Number two. I'm moving fast this morning. If I can move as fast as I did in my announcements, we'll be a record set in new day today. The offense of failing personally, number two, the offense of failing, excuse the word, it's used one time in the Bible, in piety. So what's piety? Piety is defined as reverence of the supreme being and love of his character. In practice, piety is obedience to his will. It's used one time in the Bible in connection to showing piety at home, and it, it's talking about reverence of parents or friends accompanied with affection, devotion, and honor to their, to their honor and happiness. So piety is the right kind of feelings toward God, right? That's a spiritual thing. And then it's to be played out practically in your life. That's piety. You know, sometimes we don't love God like we should. Does that ever hit you? Do you ever feel like a hypocrite when you come to church? I, I agree with my preacher. He says, I'm sick of people saying, talking about the hypocrites in the church. I'm so sick of it. He said, I, what I tell him now is, there's room for one more. Come join us. Do you ever feel like a hypocrite? You know what I've watched the devil do in the short 14 years that I've been pastoring? I have watched the devil get Christians offended because they fail in their piety towards Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I got a real bad spirit about me, and I'm just upset, and I'm offended, and so I'm not coming to church. You miss the real offense. We don't want to come in there and drag it down for everybody else. Don't give yourself so much credit. Just because you're pouting doesn't mean the rest of us are going to have a good day. Amen. Well, I just, I just don't want a holy place like that to be contaminated with my awful spirit. Uh, hello. You got a bunch of sinners gathering here and the long ki loving kindness and the long suffering and the mercy of God shows up and meets with us and gives us a good church service. Do you understand that? The long suffering, the loving kindness and the mercy and grace of God shows up in this room when we have a good service in spite of the fact that there's a bunch of failures and a bunch of sinners that need to get right half the time in the room. Don't give yourself so much credit. I don't want my rotten spirit to drag the service down. Why don't you drag your rotten carcass in here with your rotten spirit and sit under the sound of the Bible preaching and see if the Spirit of God will get that rotten spirit out of you. Amen. The real offense is in saying, I'm failing in loving God like I should. Well, get in line. Yes, sir. I try to love Him. I, I, do, I believe that I do love Him. I don't think that's arrogant or me trying to be self-righteous to show you how spiritual I am. I don't think I 
do that too much, do I? Maybe I'm a little too carnal sometimes in the way I talk, but I love the Lord. Man, there are times I realize I don't love him like I should. There are times that he asks things of me that I, I really fail in. I got, some, I got some certain weaknesses, man, that just, not, not moral failures and stuff. I'm talking about just certain weaknesses that just like, man, I got to get that under control and I have a hard time with it. Look at verses 37 and 38. The disciples failed in their piety, their devotion to God, their love for him, their reverence to him. They're really being able to, the, the spiritual application of that piety and being to, really able to understand what he's saying and what he's doing. Look at verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly, exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. Now, the Lord's going through a really, really bad spot. Fair to say? Talked about the guilt of sin, right? The pressure. The pressure that was on the disciples was nothing compared to the pressure that was on the Lord Jesus Christ. He's being crushed underneath the press and the pressure that Almighty God Himself is putting on His Son. So He tells the disciples, come with me. I mean, three guys that got picked out of all the disciples, the, 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 the favorites, the ones that were the closest, the inner circle, they get called to have a special opportunity. What a unique opportunity to be able to be there in the garden and be the closest to Jesus Christ while he's praying in Gethsemane, while he's praying before the cross, while all of the demons of hell are coming out from all over the universe and showing up in that place. They had a chance to be there with the Lord and to say, we'll stay up and pray with you. And they failed in their devotion to Jesus Christ. Because what happens in verse number 40, he cometh to the disciples and findeth them what? Saith unto Peter, what? Could ye not watch with me one hour? He says it to Peter. He didn't pick on the other two. He said it to Peter, the loudmouth. Peter, the leader. Peter, the one that always thought he'd make it. He said, guys, I've only been praying for an hour. You guys, you guys realize how long an hour is? You, 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 I mean, I'll tell you what. Go home this afternoon to understand it. Go home this afternoon. Put on your gym shorts and your basketball your basketball shorts and your gym shoes. Okay. I did not say yoga pants, guys. <laughs> I didn't think I had to say that here. If I have to say this here, please don't tell me. I will not ever look at you the same. Okay. <laughs> Get out on the trail and push yourself to run as hard as you can run, as hard as you can, not jog. Don't take it easy for an hour. Actually, don't, because we might have heart attacks. <laughs> Say an hour is not long. It depends on how much pressure you're under. You understand the analogy? Have you ever tried to pray for an hour? You know, I'll, I'll tell you this, because you need to hear it. Sometimes I get on my floor in the office, and the sun's shining through. I always lay in the sun when it's cold. And I'll start out praying. The next thing I know, I wake up. <laughs> I said that because you need to hear it because have you ever been there? Try praying for one hour. You know that ain't much to ask. We've done all night prayer meetings here in this church. Well, that's brutal. You know how hard that is? That's a lot harder than you think it is. You know what's one of the greatest joys of that prayer meeting? Listening to guys snore. Just thinking I have to hit him and wake him up, man. It's like, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. They're drooling. He said you couldn't watch one hour? Their, their flesh. Didn't I say your number one enemy was going to be your flesh? Their flesh couldn't stay awake for one hour. For one hour. To pray with Jesus Christ when he was exceedingly sorrowful. They loved him. They cared about him. They saw the pain he was in. And he just said, hey, I want you three guys to come with me. 
And rather than sitting up for one hour to try to comfort him, to try to be there with him, to try to back him up, to try to support him, they fell asleep. Now, aren't you glad you ain't one of these three guys? Because that's in the eternal word of God for us to still preach about this morning. But you know what God's you doing? God's using their failures to show you that even guys that are that close to him fail in their piety towards Jesus Christ. They fail in their devotion to Jesus Christ. They fail in their love for Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to give you an excuse this morning to mess up. That's not the point of this message. I'm not trying to give you this, well, we all fail. Oh, that was really a blessing, preacher. Now I can go live like the devil. This message is not for you. This message is for people that are really trying and the devil's getting advantage of them because the devil shows them how they constantly keep falling short of what they actually should do. And before long, it's like, well, I'm not going to go this morning. They're failing in the spiritual application. He's, he's telling them what's going to happen. And you know what? They didn't even get it. They didn't even understand. You ever read your Bible and not get it? Does that ever discourage you? You know what just happened? You read your Bible asking God for something. You're like, I don't understand this. I don't get it. I'm not spiritual enough. Try to ask the preacher. Hopefully he knows. Well, I mean, I don't really understand it anyways. You know what's happening? That subtle serpent's coming in there, and he's weaving into your mind. And he's saying, what's the point in reading it? You don't understand it anyhow. What's the point in reading it? You don't get nothing out of this. What's the point in reading it? You're never going to get it. You're failing in your piety. God doesn't speak to you, does he? But that thing was not just spiritually applied. There's a practical lesson in it, too. Look at verse 39. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Then verse 40, he cometh to the disciples, findeth them asleep, saith unto Peter, What, could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. He left them again and went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. You know what the Lord's trying to show them here? He's trying to show them the need to pray. He goes to pray, right? He comes back, they're sleeping. What, could you not watch one hour? He wakes them up and gives them another chance to pray. He goes away to pray. He comes back the second time, finds them asleep, doesn't say nothing, goes back away and prays again a third time. You know what he's telling them? He's telling them, you fellas need to pray. It was very important to the Lord that they had a prayer life. They never said, Lord, teach us to preach. You know what they said? Lord, teach us to pray. You fail in your prayer life? See, there's a practical application to failing in piety. It's like, man, Lord, I don't love you like I should. I, and I, I, since I don't love you like I should, I'm not involved like I should. I don't love others like I should. I don't witness like I should. But there's a spiritual side to that whole thing, too, that, man, you and I need to be people that are praying. We need to be seeking God's face. We need to be a witness. We need to be in our Bibles. We need to get victory over our sin. That so easily besets us. Some of you need victory over your emotions. Do you hear me? You, you get depressed and you get discouraged. And listen, I, there's per, different personality types and that's all good. That's fine. Not everybody has to be happy all the time. You know what I mean? But the devil gets advantage of some of you and your emotions. You need the victory over that. Over your stress. Over your mindset. You know how you're going to get that victory? I can preach till I'm blue in the face and you're not going to get the victory. I can hammer on your sin every week, three times a week, relentlessly. And you won't get the victory. You know how you're going to get the victory? You need to go get along with God. And you need to pray and pray and pray and pray. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Keep your finger here in the book of Matthew because we're going to come right back, but I want you to flip over to Romans with me real quick. Romans chapter number 8. Because here's what happens next when I tell you you need a prayer life. The next thing that comes back at me as well, I don't really know how to pray. 
You know, how do, what do I do? I, I'm not really a prayer. I pray in my car on the way to work. I pray I'm walking around. And listen to me. My, one of my daughters asked me about this yesterday. She said, Dad, do you always close your eyes when you pray? I said, better not because sometimes I'm driving. Her mom said that. Better not because sometimes I'm driving. Right? So, no, you don't always get on your knees and close your eyes and pray. But let me tell you something. If your only prayer life, your only prayer time is on your way to work at the wheel, you probably need to find more time in your schedule. Well, I don't have the time. Okay, I'm not going to argue that right now because that's an excuse. You probably need to find the time to get alone with God in a quiet place, on your knees or on your face, if at all possible, and talk to the Lord. I don't know how to pray. You don't have to know how to pray. Watch. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse uh, 30, 26. Excuse me. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Do you see that? I don't know how. That's an infirmity. Infirmity is your flesh, your human mentality, the fact that you're missing the point, your weaknesses, your pains, your offenses. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. You know what the Bible told you? Oh, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what that... That's, yeah, you're right. Right out of your mouth, you're actually speaking the truth of the Word of God. But you're still told to pray. I'm not much of a prayer. You're still told to pray. God knew that. He said that. And he told you to do it because he's made a way to get the job done that you don't even understand. But you got to obey. Why? Because you're told to obey. He helps our infirmities, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. That's not you getting down and the Spirit coming over you and your groaning groanings that can't be uttered. It said the Spirit itself, not you. So that's not a good verse to say, well, see there, I'm praying in the Spirit and I'm speaking in tongues. He's saying it cannot be, which cannot be uttered. Cannot be uttered. So how is that somebody praying in the Spirit and praying in tongues? Because they're uttering it. The groanings that the Spirit makes when He goes before the Father with your prayers, He makes. You wouldn't be able to do it. Verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You get down to pray, and some of what you pray about is probably not God's will. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will. If it be possible, let this... His will was not to drink the cup that he was about to drink of. His will was not to be smitten and watch his sheep scattered. He got down and he prayed to God and the Spirit took those prayers to the Father and the Spirit, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That's the Spirit right there. It gives you the grace to say, listen, I will lay down my human will. Jesus was not resisting the will of his Father. He was being honest about his human will. And he was saying, I'll lay that one down that yours can take preeminence over mine. That's praying. And the Spirit of God searches your heart while you're praying. And He sees what's you and what's God. And He recognizes, because don't forget you're sealed with the Spirit of God. And He's in you and you're in Him. So when you get down to pray, something spiritually is going on, Peter, that you don't realize. There's a whole nother level to this thing. There's a supernatural thing happening when you get down to get a hold of God. Hey, Daniel prayed, and it took 14 days, I believe it was, because while he was praying, God answered right away, but the devil tried to come in between. Hey, from the day he prayed, God was answering, and he wasn't seeing the results because the devil was trying to stop it. Think about that. There's things going on in the spirit world between you and God and the devil and the world and the flesh and everything else that's trying to block that prayer life of yours, trying to get you to fail in that. And when you realize, well, I'm not much of a prayer, you know what happens to almost every Christian when you feel like you're not good about your prayer life? You stop. You give up. You got offended. And it's so subtle and so powerful 
that it is Luciferian. We got you. Look at the next verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know, everybody quotes this verse. And you quote it in context of any time something tragic happens. And all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to this verse. But in context, Romans 8, 28 is talking about your prayer life in context. Back to Matthew 26. The Lord was trying to make a point to those boys, hey guys, the greatest battle of all the universe is about to take place. And what we're going to do is we're going to get on our knees and we're going to talk to God. Some of you try to work out marriage problems, family problems, kid problems. Some of you try to witness and soul win and witness to lost family members or backslidden family members or coworkers. You got all these problems you're trying to work out. You come to hear the preaching and you're trying to get something from God and you read your Bible and you're trying to get an answer. But you're missing what you really need to be doing. We're trying to teach our kids, aren't we? Actively involved in that, working on it. Don't be so busy working on them that you fail in your piety to Jesus Christ, your devotion to Jesus Christ, your recognition that there's things that he can do that I can't do and I need to talk to him about this. I need to get on my face about this. I need to reach out to God about this. Some of you need some victory in your life over some sin or some emotions or some faults. And the only thing that you're just failing because you're not praying like you should. Well, I prayed and God didn't answer. Oh, so the Bible says if he doesn't answer, quit praying? It's not what it says. Let's get to the last point. The offense of the flesh's puniness. You, 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 puny means little, tiny, insignificant. You know the actual definition of the word puny means approaching zero? And that's your flesh. Look at verse 41b. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. You know why a lot of Christians quit? Because they realize how weak their flesh is. Man, when you start thinking you got it together and you're doing good and you've got the victory and then you fail, you told God, I'll never do that again, Lord. Forgive me, please, and you got it right. And you quit. And then, boy, the right set of circumstances comes. You're just tired enough. The right setup happens. You did it again. You feel like, you know what, I can't even ask God to forgive me again. Because if I was serious last time, I wouldn't have done this again. And I must not be serious. And nothing could be farther from the truth. You underestimated the weakness of your flesh. And that's what got you. And you allowed circumstances and time and whatever it was, the busyness of life, to get you away from the shepherd. He said, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered abroad. Why? Because he got the shepherd away from the sheep for a little while. And the moment you got Jesus Christ away from those disciples, Peter failed miserably. Because Peter's real strength was not in Peter. Peter's real strength was in his relationship with and his closeness to and the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in Peter's life. Did you follow that? You get the application to you, right? You know it's not that hard to serve God. <clears throat> so hard to do right. <laughs> Look, I've said it myself, so please don't be offended at the next thing I'm going to say, okay? Because I've said it myself a lot of times. You're an idiot. Mike, you're an idiot. It's not that hard to do right. It's hard to do wrong. But, but let, me, let me grant you this, Mike. When you're not close to Jesus Christ and walking with him and sticking with him in the power of the flesh, it is real hard to do right. Because this flesh doesn't want to do right. Watch and pray one hour. <laughs> yeah, whatever, man. It got quiet. It got calmed down. It got dark. And I'm out. Good night. Do you know, my, I, you know, I look forward to getting into my bed at the end of the day. Anybody else like that? Or is it just me? There's a few of us. Okay, good. I like, I like, that's like, 
<clears throat> my happy place. You understand what I'm saying? I was walking out of the bathroom the other day, and I looked over at my side of the bed as I was heading back down to my office, and I was like, oh, that looks so good right now. You know what that is? That's the flesh. It's like, yeah, let me sleep, man. Let me relax. Let me chill. Let me forget about everything and just tune it all out. The limits of our human weakness is an offense that the devil uses against us. I showed you in Revelation, he's the accuser of the brethren. You're limited by your flesh. But notice, look at verse 42. He went away again, and the second time he prayed. And he came again. You know what the Lord's showing us in the text? He's given them chance after chance after chance. In verse 43, he comes and finds them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. And verse 44, and he left them alone. You know what I see in that? I see Jesus tell them what to do. They can't do it. He comes back, he checks on them. They messed up. Again. And he goes, you know what? I'll take care of you. Sleep on, fellas. Take your rest. You know, I appreciate a God like that. I appreciate the fact that he sees me tired, trying. It's in verse 45. He comes to the disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sin. You know what I, think I appreciate about that? God gave him a chance. I mean, a chance to mark eternity. The only guy that prayed with Jesus. They messed it up. God, because that gives him another chance. They messed it up. Now, you know what the devil tells you when you've messed it up that much? You missed your opportunity. You didn't get saved when you were a kid like some of the other ones around here. You messed things up. You, you got saved too late in life, and you're too much of a train wreck, and too many things have gone wrong already, and you're just a failure. You know what Jesus said? You guys got the right spirit. <laughs> but your flesh is what's giving you a hard time. You know, I appreciate the Lord that looks and sees the right heart, the right spirit, the right effort. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Jesus looks at him and he says, all right, fellas, go ahead and take your rest. I know what you're going to go through pretty soon, so just sleep on. And while they're sleeping, Jesus is praying. I don't know what he did at that point, because it says he comes to the disciples in verse 45 and says to them, sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So they're tuned out. They're failing in their piety. They're completely tuned out of him and what's going on around him, and they're just snoring away. I don't know how long he sat there, but it wasn't long. And then in verse 46, he says, Rise, let us be going. Behold, he's at hand. Hey, fellas, wake up. Here comes Judas. There's the Lord under a pressure level that the disciples didn't even realize. Gethsemane, olive press being smashed. Crying out to the Father, please let this cup pass from me. He was going to drink the guilt of sin, the wrath of God, the judgment of God on sin. You remember how I mentioned just a little bit ago like feeling guilty because you did something wrong? Could you imagine being Jesus Christ and feeling the guilt of a whole world? And the Father saying, I'm going to take it all out on you. I'm going to be justified and I'm going to pour out the wrath of God on my only begotten son so Mike Reagan and a whole bunch of them other people can actually find forgiveness for their sins. That's the pressure Jesus Christ is under. He knew it before it happened. But look, look with me interestingly at verse number 39 and we're done. He knew what was coming, right? He knew the amount of pressure he was going to be under and he went a little further, watch it, and fell on his face and prayed. Now here's what I believe he did. I believe he actually told him to wait, went a little further. He's wore out, man. He's just as tired as they are. They've been following him around, but he's the one doing all the work. He's literally humanly exhausted. If you looked at him, I imagine he would have had sunken in eyes, bloodshot eyes, beyond the realm of what we can possibly comprehend. 
And I think he literally went a little further and just. <laughs> because it didn't say he went a little further and laid on his face. It says he went a little further and fell on his face. I think he was exhausted. Took those few more steps and boom. But you know what he didn't do? He didn't quit. You know what Jesus Christ was? He was scandalized. We mean he had not born of fornication. He took the sin of the whole world. He took every scandal you've ever committed on himself. He was stumbled. He fell. On his face. He didn't fall into sin. You know what I'm saying. He fell on his face. He was offended. He was attacked by the devil. But he went a little farther. And as a result of going a little farther, he got through it and he got the victory. And he rose again. And he lives forevermore. And he's got pleasure and joy and rejoicing and victory for eternity in your Savior. So this morning I'm trying to tell you you're going to be offended. But go a little farther. Don't quit. Because if you take a few more steps, the victory's not far away. You know why the devil turned it up, put the pressure on you, has got you about to quit? Because he knows you're about to make it. And he doesn't want to see you go a little farther. Let's stand to our feet this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. <coughs> Want to get